the uh, NetTalk system, which is a, or was a very nice application of uh, backpropagation um, in 1986. Um, and I mean, I presented the, the audio file with the, with the old uh, uh, voice of the, the trained uh, NetTalk system. And uh, so you, you saw or you heard how it works and that it works towards the end after uh, three times training um, at least some of the sentences were understandable even for us Germans. Um, so maybe I should talk a little bit more about the training strategy. Yeah? Um, I mean, you, you saw the, the basics, the low-level basics, the structure of the backpropagation network, but now um, this network has to be trained. Yeah? Um, and because this is uh, supervised learning, we need to provide uh, training data for this network. That means we need to provide a large set of input-output pairs. Uh, so, I mean, the input is no problem. We can just deliver any text. Uh, but the output, the output here is the problem. We have to provide these uh, vocal um, uh, encodings. Uh, and uh, so what they did, was with quite a bit of effort, uh, they asked people, linguists, whatever, to provide this output for, for every single character. Um, and they encoded this in files and uh, on such files the system was trained. Okay. Yeah, okay, so um, neural network um, programming, of course you can, you can use any programming language to implement, for example, backpropagation or some different algorithm, but I, if you really want to solve some serious problems uh, with neural networks, you shouldn't do the prog programming by yourself. Uh, of course you could implement backpropagation, but nowadays backpropagation backpro no longer is the, the best uh, multi-layer uh, perceptron system. Uh, there are improvements of backpropagation, we will, we will come into this. For example, uh, QuickProp and even better, um, RProp. Uh, um, and uh, implementing such improved system is not easy at all because there are so many tricks in, in the code. So uh, I would suggest you use some software and there exists for many languages uh, packages for neural networks and there even exist uh, full-fledged simulators like uh, this um, so, uh, originally this uh, tool was called SNNS, Stuttgart Neural Network Simulator. And uh, so this simulator uh, spread all over the world. Uh, it was one of the most popular simulators. Uh, it was programmed in C. And then as a successor nowadays, there is Java NNS. Uh? Um, and uh, just to give you an impression how this works, the idea is, of course, you have the software, the, uh, you, you can use the programs for training and then for application. Um, uh, and you do have some nice graphical tools to visualize, to visualize the activations of neurons and to visualize the weights in the network. Yeah? Um, and here you see the application of this Java NNS um, to the NetTalk system. 
Um, for example, here in this diagram you see the uh, so-called learning curve which displays the sum of the squared errors in the output units over the time. And what you can see here is that it monotonically de decreases. Here you have a control panel. Uh, for example, in this little uh, um, field you see the eta parameter, which is the learning rate. And this is here set to uh, 0.2. Uh, um, yeah. And here you can see the learning function, which means the learning algorithm that was selected. Um, yeah. And what you see here is the network itself. Uh, this is the, the neurons in the input layer, the hidden layer, and the output layer. Let's start with the output layer. Um, in, in NetTalk, we have 26 output neurons, what we have here, 80 hidden neurons, and uh, how much was it? How many input units? 203. Yeah. So these are the input units. And you see that uh, not many of them are active. The green ones are the active ones. I mean, um, yeah, it should actually be every something like 29th neuron should be active. Yeah, actually only seven of them. But this is more than seven. Why fear from six? Fourteen are active. I have no idea why there are 14. Okay, and another feature um, of such simulators is you can not only um, display the activations of the neurons, but also the weights. But here, how many weights do we have? Um, 18,000 weights. So there is no chance to display 18,000 weights on a screen. Uh, and even if we could, it wouldn't help you. Huh? Uh, and that's, I mean, this is one of the real serious disadvantages of neural networks. Because, I mean, what the, what the network has learned is the set of weights. But how can a human understand 18,000 weights? No chance. Huh? So, and, and, and that's the real problem. There is no chance for uh, something like a uh, software engineering of neural networks. That's a real disadvantage. Okay, yeah, and now I want to show you another application of the backpropagation network, which was actually developed um, not so long after NetTalk. It, uh, so NetTalk was in 86 and this was in around 1990. I don't remember exactly. So that's actually what I did when I was a young researcher. Yeah? I got in contact uh, with neural networks, but at that time I worked in, a, in an AI group in Munich where we developed an automated theorem prover, so which is purely logic, Pre uh, first order predicate logic. And uh, such theorem provers, they suffer from uh, tremendous search spaces. So these search spaces uh, of a theorem prover, they are by far uh, larger than what you have seen in a chess computer of, or uh, such. Uh, map searching algorithms. Uh, so th th these these are really uh, extreme search spaces. And when I when I got into this group as a young researcher, I already knew a little bit of neural networks, and I saw how these guys tried with brute force methods to search these extreme spaces. 
And to me, it was immediately obvious that there is no chance for uh, really serious problems to find a solution in these uh, large search spaces. And so I got the idea, why don't we try to apply neural networks that help uh, searching these spaces? And the idea is, I mean, the idea is what, what happens in our brain? When you do theorem proofing in mathematics, that's actually what you do. Um, and you know that it's, it's not easy to prove theorems in mathematics. Why is it not easy? Because there is no schematic procedure. Huh? If you have to find the derivative of a function in closed form, there is, a, uh, there is an algorithm you can apply and then deterministically you, you will find the first derivative. But when you have to prove a theorem, there is no algorithm, so you have to do combinatorial search. Uh, and as a beginner, you will have a hard time. But if you look at an, at an experienced mathematician, such a person has experience in his or her brain and uh, can then apply this experience to guide the search uh, of uh, during uh, theorem proving. And this experience has been learned with this neural network from past uh, past uh, trials, uh, maybe successful or non-successful trials. And that was my idea um, to, yeah, to, to use heuristics. We talked about heuristics when we talked about search algorithms. But the problem is in such a hard and difficult domain to find a good heuristic. No programmer would have an idea about a good heuristic uh, for, for an automated theorem prover. And even more the problem is that we humans, um, we do the theorem proving on a very high and abstract level. But these machines, these automated theorem provers, they are kind of assembler level theorem proving, extremely low level, so no human has an intuition how to guide such a low level theorem prover. So the, the solution was the theorem prover has to learn by himself. Uh, that was the idea. And let me show it in, in this picture what we did. So this theorem prover searches a huge tree. I mean this is a really tiny fraction of such a tree. Um, and now we just let this prover run uh, with the brute force search. Maybe it uses um, breadth first search or depth first search. So it kind of randomly explores such a tree. And for the le learning phase, it takes a lot of time. So we let this prover run for days and weeks. Huh? And occasionally, hopefully, from time to time for easy problems, this theorem prover will find a proof. For example, suppose this would be a proof. So this is one uh, path in the search tree uh, where we have a success node here at the end of the, of the path. Okay, and, and this is a, a positive experience. From this positive experience, um, we conclude that all these decisions, first decision, second, third, and fourth, were uh, good decisions. So we can now label these uh, branches uh, as positive training data. Huh? Um, but all the other branches uh, at these decision points, so these two are negative, this one is negative, these two are negative, and this one is negative. Um, and all the others, they are not labeled because we don't know what, what, what happens with them. Uh, and that's the way how we collected training data. Yeah? So we, we label our nodes as positive or negative training data. Um, yeah, uh, okay, and, but maybe we should go into more details. 
because you don't know yet how how you would train a backpropagation network. So um, yeah. Of course, we used a three-layer network because if we would have used um, only a two-layer network, um, it wouldn't be powerful enough. We really need the ability to encode nonlinear mappings. Okay, and now the question for our training data is, how do we encode such a node as an input and what is our target output? What is the target output? Uh, okay, let's start with the output because this is easier. We know it already. So we have uh, a plus or minus one, for example, as a target output. Uh, that's it. Yeah? Or, um, oh yeah, so, sorry. Um, so it's a zero or a one because backpropagation, at least in the normal variant, only works with values 0 or 1. Yeah? So 0 means negative, 1 may means positive. But what, what should we put here as an input? That's not so easy. Yeah? Um, we could, in principle, try to, I mean, it's, it's typically about formulas. If, uh, oh, you don't know the resolution calculus. This will come next semester. But in such a calculus, uh, the, the prover typically has the alternative to select formula number one, number two, number three, if there are three branches. And then we could try to encode the whole formula here. Um, but what are the disadvantages of encoding a formula as the input? Yeah, one first obvious disadvantage would be this, the, the length of such a formula is not limited. So the formula may be only three characters, but it may be 500 characters. And how could you encode a formula with arbitrary length on a fixed width uh, input layer of the backpropagation network? Uh, that, uh, that's problem, problematic. Of course, we could say, okay, Let's assume the maximum length of our formula is 200 characters, and then I take 200 input units, but such networks don't work good if most of the time only the first 10 units are active. Huh? So this is not a good idea. Secondly, just using the syntax of the, of the formula is not a good idea either, because there may be semantically equivalent formulas I mean, uh, uh, it doesn't matter at all whether a variable name is A or B or X. Yeah? Um, so just using the syntax isn't a good idea either. So we have to think of features. And that's what we do all the time when we do machine learning. We use features of our real data. For example, if you do image processing, typically you wouldn't use the whole image with 10 million pixels as input because then you would, ten, you would need 10 million input neurons and you wouldn't have the computational resources uh, to deal with this. So you have to use some a little bit more abstract features about the image. Yeah? Um, and here what we did, we used numeric features about the, the formula. For example, first input would be uh, the number of variables in the formula, the number of constants in the formula, the number of function symbols, um, the number of logical operators, and, and things like that, and maybe the number of binary predicates, whatever. So uh, a finite and fixed set of features about the formula that we consider. And uh, so now then, during training, we just collect such feature vectors together with their labels, whether they were positive or negative, write them down in a training file, and then apply backpropagation to the training file. 
and after training we would then use this backpropagation network to label uh, different nodes. So now if I have the alternative between let's say four branches then I would apply backpropagation to branch number one, two, three and four and then select the one with the highest output value. Is that clear? No questions? Yeah? Can neurons have multiple values? Or can they not be active or not active? Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, in, it depends on our neural network type. For example, in the Hopfield network, um, the neurons only can have the values plus or minus one. Just binary. But in backpropagation, the activation of a neuron uh, may have an arbitrary value between zero and one. Oh yes, we are. I mean, we have seen it here. Look, with these hidden units, you see there are, there are different uh, variations of green and uh, purple. Yeah. So that means during training, we only use zero and one for the labels here. But when, when I later on then apply the backpropagation network, the output may well be 0.7. Huh? Maybe the network isn't quite sure whether it's positive or negative. And then we will take the decision. We will just take uh, the branch with the highest output value. Okay, no more questions? And this was actually uh, quite successful. Let me see, do we have uh, results? No, we don't have the result figure. So what we achieved was with this train, these trained neural networks to guide the search of the prover, the search times uh, reduced drastically. So it's the, our theorem proof was then, um, it, it depended on the applications, but it, you know, on average about 10,000 times faster than it was before. Uh, I mean, that sounds uh, extremely good, but on such a really hard problem, a factor of 10,000 helps just a tiny little bit. Uh, it's just a tiny little improvement. Okay, yeah. Um, okay, yeah, let's talk about uh, problems and improvements of the backpropagation learning algorithm. Um, yeah, I, we do have the problem of local minima. I already mentioned this. Um, convergence is often extremely slow of backpropagation and there has been a lot of work on improving the speed of backpropagation and the most successful attempt uh, was the RPROP system. This stands for resilient propagation and it was developed by Martin Riedmiller um, he is a German professor and he meanwhile is, he was in um, Osnabrück, but now he moved to, to south of Germany. I guess he now is in Freiburg. Either Freiburg or Darmstadt, I'm not sure. Um, and, and this is now the backpropagation variant to be used nowadays because it's really much faster and much better than backpropagation. Um, but let's first talk about um, a simpler attempt to improve backpropagation. Look at this, uh, this picture. I already showed you that if you have such a, a valley of the error function, yeah? so suppose down here somewhere is a minimum of the error function, and we start here with the ordinary backpropagation and with a learning rate eta, which is not extremely small, then it may happen 
that we get such oscillations back and forth between the two sides of the valley. Um, and now the idea uh, to, to prevent this extreme oscillation is to get a behavior like that. And uh, this is, uh, how, how can this be achieved? Um, so people used a so-called momentum term. Uh, what is a momentum term? Um, uh, you know what's a momentum in, in physics. So if uh, some uh, physical object with a certain mass moves through space, so if I would now throw this chalk, it would just keep its direction uh, as long as there is no force. Uh, that's what we call momentum. Momentum tries to, to preserve the movement. Okay, and the momentum term, if I made this step, then uh, a particle would have the momentum to continue in this direction. Uh, and now, but our next step goes in this direction. And now what, what we do is we add such a momentum term, so we take the direction of the last step with a small weight. And that's what we have here in this formula. Look, uh, this is the formula for the weight change of this weight Wji. Uh, delta Wji um, at the time at time t is, I mean, this is the normal backpropagation formula. It's eta times this delta term times xi. Yeah? And now we add this, this is the momentum term. We look here, this is delta wji, the same thing as here, but from t minus 1. So this is the last, the previous uh, weight change. And this is being multiplied with a small constant. This, I mean, this constant gamma is a number which definitely has to be smaller than 1, so maybe 0.1 or something like that. Huh? And this leads to um, kind of a damping of these oscillations. They are getting exponentially smaller, and so we get a, a better movement towards the minimum. So this uh, was a, a slight improvement, but it turned out it didn't really solve all the problems. Um, yes, okay. And then people tried to use different error functions. So what we used here was the sum of the, all the squared errors. But why do we need to use the squared errors? Huh? Um, people then tried to use just the, the absolute values of the differences, so not the squared errors, but just the linear error. Um, and this turned out to be quite a good idea, not only with backpropagation. Nowadays, uh, these uh, approaches are, uh, are called uh, learning algorithms based on the so-called L1 norm. I mean, this is a term from functional analysis, um, and what normally is used is the L2 norm. Yeah? So the, the, uh, the, the sum of the squared errors is based on the L2 norm. The 2 is, um, we just to take the, the, uh, the second power of the differences, and this is based on the Euclidean norm. And the Euclidean norm is called the L2 norm and the L1 norm. Uh, this is nowadays quite popular. Um, I mean, they didn't in the beginning use the L1 norm because the L1 norm is not differentiable in the origin. Yeah, um, yeah I mean, if you look at, at uh, real numbers x, and uh, the one norm of real numbers is just the absolute value. And uh, so we, we do have, um, at, at this point in the origin, it's not differentiable. Huh? But the L2 norm, which is a parabola, 
is differentiable. And because we do minimize the error, we have to compute the first derivative. And in particular, around the origin, it's important. And now this function is not differentiable in the origin, but people have later on found methods to deal with this not differentiability. So nowadays, uh, they also use L1 norm algorithms. OK, yeah. OK, yeah, and uh, so there is this RPROP algorithm by Riedmiller, and there was inter in an intermediate algorithm called QuickProp, which was an improvement of backpropagation too. Um, yes, maybe I should talk about the RPROP algorithm. The RPROP algorithm is a, a really very good heuristic Im improvement of the backpropagation algorithm. Um, and what, uh, what does it mean, heuristic? Look at such an example. Yes, I mean, uh, I had a different example. No, this was, where was it? Oh yes, it was when we talked here about the delta hole. So we, our first attempt to solve this oscillation problem was to use a really tiny eta. But then if we have this tiny eta, then when we come down here, the, 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 the length of the gradient vector is very, very uh, small here. And that's why we have these tiny steps and it takes extremely long to move down here. And what they did with the RPROP algorithm, they used heuristics. Uh, for example, if we know the direction of the gradient, and, I mean, the gradient is a vector, so it has a direction and a length. And then they used some scheme like, um, they, adapt, they used an adaptive learning rate eta. So if the gradient is extremely small, so that means we have very flat terrain, then they try to increase eta. And now if it's going down very steep, then we should use a smaller eta because the gradient already has a, a huge absolute value. And that if then the, the learning rate is large too, that will may throw us over mountains into the next valley, wherever. Yeah? So if the, the, the gradient is large, then use a small eta. If the gradient is small, use a large eta. And they used many other heuristics. For example, uh, it may happen that the algorithm uh, ends up on a, a saddle point. If there is a saddle point, suppose we have a maximum here, another maximum here, and now here, it, uh, here we, we would have a saddle point. A saddle point means um, the gradient is zero, but we didn't reach a minimum. Yeah? And of course we can find out whether this is a saddle point by computing the gradient in different directions. Yeah? So if in this direction the gradient is positive and in this direction negative, we know that's a saddle point, so we have to move on. But if we wouldn't do this, if the gradient is zero, learning stops. Yeah? And so they, they used many kinds of such heuristics and this improved backpropagation dramatically. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so much about backpropagation. It's very popular and you should, you should do some experiments with backpropagation. So uh, either use this Java NNS tool or you can also use the, the K9 data mining uh, tool set or you use just some library uh, for, for any programming language. I already mentioned this Veka library, which is a Java library. Uh, that's actually the, the, uh, the most popular uh, library. Yeah. Okay, yeah, any questions about this famous backpropagation algorithm?
Okay, now let's continue. Um, yeah, the, there is, so I included this um, little section about support vector machines uh, because nowadays support vector machines are quite popular uh, learning algorithms. Um, uh, so we shouldn't, we shouldn't actually call them neural networks even though they are somehow related to neural networks. Yeah. Um, yeah um, so let's start with linear neural networks. Or um, re uh, remember what we know about linear neural networks. I mean, such a linear network has many advantages. We have a fast learning, we have guaranteed convergence. Yeah? Um, the, the, the reason for the guaranteed convergence is that in linear networks there are no local minima. Yeah? Um, so if we use a, a good and stable algorithm it will converge to a global minimum. Um, yeah. And we have low danger for overfitting. Um, what is overfitting? Overfitting happens um, when you use a learning algorithm that has many parameters, many degrees of freedom and it can adapt to all details of my training data. Uh, and it may even learn random noise inherent in the, uh, the training data. But if I have an, an, a learning algorithm that has only a small number of parameters, so suppose you take a neural network with only 10 weights, uh, or only 5 weights for example, then um, and you use uh, uh, a million training data, then of course five, five real numbers cannot remember a million training data. Uh, so they, they have to generalize. But on the other hand, if you use a neural network with 10,000 weights and only 10 training data, then of course all the training data will be stored exactly in the network. Uh, and if you use such linear networks, linear networks, they are two-layer networks. You only have an, one output unit and maybe 20 input units, then you have 20 weights and that's it. But as soon as you use a multi-layer network, you have the full connection here and the number of weights increases dramatically and uh, so there is the danger of overfitting. Uh, you could, you could control, control this danger by controlling the number of hidden units and that's actually what you do. You have to manually set the number of hidden units. And I already told you last time, I would always start with a very small number of hidden units and then gradually increase the number of hidden units and always watch when does the network start to overfit and then we go back and uh, decrease the number of hidden units a little bit. Okay, so in nonlinear networks, we do have the danger of overfitting. In linear networks, no danger of overfitting. So you see, there is a couple of advantages of linear networks. And maybe the biggest advantage is that uh, we can easily understand the mathematics of linear systems because it's basically linear algebra. Huh? And linear algebra is so popular because it is easy and because we can understand it and because we do have stable algorithms and we will see in the math lecture uh, the power of uh, linear systems. Uh, in the next few weeks we will see the power of linear systems in terms of functional ap approximation. So uh, researchers always wanted to use linear systems but on the, uh, on the other hand uh, the linear systems, they are not able to approximate complex functions. They, of course, a linear system uh, is a linear approximation of uh, the application I want to learn. 
and uh, quite often a linear approximation is too weak. Uh, um, yeah. Okay, but if I go to a nonlinear network, then I have the problem of local minima, convergence problems, overfitting, and the, and the idea behind support vector machines was to combine the advantages of linear systems and nonlinear systems in one system. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, now, here we, we are, let's look at such a, a classification problem. I mean, support vector machines can be used for cl classification and for regression. But let's, for a moment, for now, just look at classification. So if we have such a two-class classification task, we have our positive training data, our negative training data, and if they are linearly separable, oh, I mean, then everything is easy and fine because we can use a perceptron, for example. We can use any linear classifier. And then uh, the, the things are easy. Yeah? Um, and now, but what, uh, what, what support vector machines do on such linearly separable problems is it's better than what the perceptron does. Um, uh, I hope you remember uh, what what the perceptron does. The perceptron algorithm starts with some uh, separating line. Uh, maybe the, the initial line is like this and then the line is adjusted until it classifies all training data correctly. So this is such a separating line. Yeah? And uh, this also is a separating line. Um, and the algorithm terminates as soon as we have, we have found one such line which may not be optimal. And what support vector machines do is they find kind of an optimal separating line. They use the so-called support vectors which are these three data points. And uh, so what is a, a support vector? Um, these are the points that uh, determine the optimal separating line. And this optimal separating line um, has the same distance to all the support vectors of the two classes. Uh, and this is such an optimal separating line. So, and that's why, why these algorithms are called support vector machines because they first determine a set of support vectors in the two classes and then the separating straight line or in, in more dim higher dimensions uh, separating hyperplane. Okay, but I mean uh, uh, the, the really big advantage of support vector machines is the so-called kernel. Uh, I mean they are often also called kernel machines. So kernel machines and support vector machines, that's the same. Uh, the same class of algorithms. Um, and the idea is the following. Um, yeah, let's see. Yeah. Uh, suppose we have such a set of training data of two classes which are not linearly separable. Um, and now the idea of the kernel machines is twofold. In the first step, we find a mapping that maps our training data into a new space um, where they are then linearly separable. Uh, so the kernel, the kernel is a mapping from these training data into a new space where, uh, where they are linearly separable. Okay? Um, and, I mean, finding such a mapping is a non-trivial task. Let's look at these training data. I mean, if I look, when I look at this picture, I can immediately give you such a mapping that linearly separates 
the two classes. Do you have an idea? What kind of mapping would you apply to the data points such that afterwards they are linearly separable? I mean, the first idea is to map the data in a higher dimensional space. We are now in a two-dimensional space and we need to add just one dimension. And we can always, for all sets of two class, for all two class problems, if I add one dimension, then immediately, if I use the, uh, the appropriate mapping, immediately the data are linearly separable. And what is the mapping? The mapping is the following. We just map all the green points. So we use this new dimension in this direction. So this is our new dimension. And now we, uh, we map all the green points. Um, so this is the value zero of the new dimension. We just move them out to the level one, the green points. And we, we leave the red points where they are. And now the green points are here, the red points are here, and if we use this uh, linear hyperplane here, then of course we do have a separation of the two classes, a linear separation. So that's trivial. It's actually trivial. Huh? Um, map the data of the one class um, in, in the new dimension out of, uh, out of the plane, uh, to a different level and then immediately we have the separating hyperplane. But why is this not so easy in practice? That's a problem. Huh? Who tells you what is the structure of the positive class and the negative class? That's what you have to know. You actually have to know the, uh, the shape of this separating line, otherwise you wouldn't know which, which points in the plane here to map out and which ones to leave there. Huh? That's the problem. So this approach does not work. To, to find an individual mapping depending on the data. This does not work. Uh, imagine, I mean, in a two-dimensional space it would be even possible. But if you have a, a 500-dimensional space, no chance. Huh? And now, um, but there are uh, support vector uh, machines or kernel machines um, which work quite well. And what, what do they do? Uh, they use sophisticated mappings that increase the dimensions of your space. Yeah? So m maybe we have a 10-dimensional input space and then the support vector machines, machine maps the data into a 100-dimensional space with some universal uh, nonlinear mapping. And in this 100-dimensional space, the chances to find a linear separating hyperplane are quite good. Yeah? Um, yes, but since we then are in a much higher dimensional space, um, we may get uh, the problems of overfitting because the number of uh, free parameters then increases and we may get overfitting and uh, they, they have to use methods that can deal with overfitting. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, uh, we should actually go into the details of the mathematics, which are not trivial at all, and that's why I just gave such a short overview of uh, the kernel machines. Yeah, oh yeah, we, here we would have this picture. Yeah. So uh, we just move one class out of the plane and then we would find a separating hyperplane. 
Okay. Yeah, and I already mentioned support vector machines uh, can be applied to classification problems and to regression problems too. Okay, and if you want to go into more details of kernel machines, uh, I mean, uh, Professor Schölkopf, he was one of the, the pioneers in the field of support vector machines. And he is a German uh, professor, he is in Tübingen at the Max Planck Institute for, I don't know, uh, but he, yeah, uh, so he is uh, an excellent mathematician in this field. Um, and then there is a machine learning book by Al Paidin, which has a nice chapter on support vector machines too, and there is this tutorial. Okay, yeah. So this finishes our chapter on neural networks. And so maybe let's, let's give some, some hints on applications. And as you can see, this list is quite long. So meanwhile, there are really many applications of neural networks. Um, in pattern recognition, of course, um, for example, analysis of photographs for recognizing uh, people, recognizing faces or uh, fingerprints, recognition of fish swarms on sonar echoes, classification of military airplanes on radar scans. Actually, there are many military applications, especially in the pattern recognition field. Recognition of speech, handwritten text, um, for example, uh, it was, I guess it was uh, at least 25 years ago when uh, the company uh, Telefunken, they built an, um, uh, an optical pattern recognition system that could read uh, the addresses on letters automatically and they, they uh, developed w one of these first intelligent letter sorting machines and they used at that time neural networks. Uh, a robot control, of course, there are so many uh, difficult uh, classification problems. Heuristic search in, in games like backgammon or chess computers. Then application to reinforcement learning, which we will see right now in the next chapter. Forecasting of uh, stock prices, which is very popular. Um, evaluation of the credit risk of uh, bank customers. Yeah, but I mean, I should say that nowadays in the machine learning community, there exist so many alternatives to neural networks which we can understand better mathematically. So that's why I and my group, um, we use neural networks only if there is no alternative. And this happens uh, very rarely. So typically we use uh, methods that we can understand better mathematically. Okay, yeah. So, summary. Um, we started with the perceptron, then uh, improved it with the delta rule. The delta rule came from the, the idea of doing gradient descent. Yeah? And then we um, applied this to our nonlinear backpropagation network. Um, yeah. And so what, what these uh, neural networks do is related to linear score system. Actually, linear score systems, we saw this, we showed this, are equivalent to a perceptron. Uh, uh, it, it can also be proven that linear scores are equivalent to the naive Bayes algorithm we have seen. Um, and the method of least squares, which we will see in a few weeks in the math lecture, this is actually what uh, backpropagation uses. Uh, um, yeah, okay, we looked at Hopfield networks, which are very nice, but due to the, the nonlinear dynamics, 
uh, we may get a chaotic uh, dynamic behavior and that's why they are not used in uh, practical applications. Associative memories are quite important in practice, Cohonen and PAL models. Um, oh yes, and, and now let me make some remarks about all the neural network models. Uh, and that was one of the reasons why they were, they were so popular um, in the 1980s. I mean, at that time, it was new to store information in a distributed way. Huh? So the, uh, if you look at such a backpropagation network with multi-layers, then the information about how to map the input to the output is not encoded in just one single number because there are so many weights. I mean, this unit has maybe, if there are 100 hidden units, then there are 100 uh, weights just from this unit to the hidden units. And now, if, for example, um, one of these weights, one of these connections is being lost, you just cut one connection, then maybe the neural network still works very well. Uh, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't worry if you lose a number of connections. If you would lose one connection, in a classical electronic circuit, uh, most of the time it would be broken, it wouldn't work anymore. Yeah? But neural networks, they are very fault tolerant. I mean, that's why our brain still works after we, uh, we have, we've gotten drunk in, uh, in the evening. Uh, you know that millions of, um, of syn synaptic connections die, even millions of neurons die uh, when you drink too much alcohol, but still you are able to to think the next day. Yeah? That's due to this uh, excellent fault tolerance of neural networks. And this fault tolerance is due to the distributed storage and due to the redundancy. Uh, that's of course a very nice property and also people call this kind of a holographic memory because in a hologram, hologram is a, a picture uh, based on some physical uh, principles and if, for example, if you take a holographic picture, it's like a classical uh, photographic image, but on the image you can't see anything. You just can see the objects even in three dimensions if you project monochromatic light onto the, such a, a glass plate, I mean the, the patterns look like that. And then if you project light onto it and you watch it from the, from the back side, then you see a, a three-dimensional uh, picture. And now what happens if you cut this glass in the middle and you throw away half of it, and then if you project light on, on, this, uh, on the remaining half of this glass plate, you still see the full image. You see everything. That's, that's holographic storage. And that's similar to the storage inside a neural network. It's distributed. I mean, what you lose is, you lose resolution. Yeah? That's like if you encode your digital image not with 10 million pixels, but only with 5 million pixels. Of course, you lose half of the pixels, but you do have the whole scene just with a lower resolution. Okay, that's what we talked about already. Networks are robust uh, against small disturbances, which means uh, against noise. Yeah? Okay, yeah, and recognition of uh, noisy patterns, of course. Okay, disadvantages, yeah, I, I mean, the, the, the advantage of the holographic memory is at the same time a disadvantage. Because we cannot locate. So now where is this, I mean, people call it the, the grandmother neuron. I mean, there is in our brain a concept uh, of grandmother. Uh? We, we all know what's a grandmother. Uh? But in which of these 10 billion neurons 
in which one of these neurons is the concept of grandmother's thought, it is distributed. So you cannot localize and say, okay, it's this neuron. I mean, that's classically in classical engineering or programming or in classical logic, there is this one grandmother predicate. And if you eliminate this predicate from your database, then there is no more, no more grandmother concept. But if you eliminate one single neuron from the brain, we still know what's a grandmother. Huh? Um, and that makes engineering so difficult. Huh? It's an extremely different paradigm. And maybe that's one of the reasons why we have so, so much problems in understanding how human or animal brains work. Okay, yeah. And that's of course one of the reasons why it's so difficult to combine neural networks with classical software knowledge engineering, with classical logic. Yeah. Okay, yeah, and what we did not, what I did not present was, for example, the so-called self-organizing maps by Kohonen, which are, uh, is a fascinating algorithm. We didn't talk about incremental learning. Um, what is incremental learning? What we looked at up to now was, we use a set of training data, then apply, uh, training data, then apply the learning algorithm, and after the learning phase comes the working phase where we apply our algorithm to new patterns. Um, and incremental learning is that our learning algorithm has kind of lifelong learning. So there is no end of the learning phase. Whenever the algorithm sees new patterns, it may improve its behavior. Huh? Um, we did not talk about sequential networks uh, for learning of time-dependent processes. Um, yeah, let's look at a sequential task. Yeah, for example, the um, net talk system. This is a typical sequential task. Um, I mean, if there is a text, so suppose we have some text, and now we are at this point. So there is one character, and uh, the system now has to pronounce this character. And of course, there is all this past. So what, what you saw in the net talk system is the naive implementation of such a sequential process, which was, I use this character and then three characters to the left and three to the right. Um, but what a sequential network would do is, I use a network with just this one character as an input but the sequential network would remember the past. That's what actually our brain does. Yeah? We remember the past and because we know the past, we know how to, um, to pronounce this character. And uh, I mean, there is an easy and straightforward way of implementing this in a neural network. I, I give you the idea. So again, uh, we have a backpropagation network with some output units. Um, and maybe some input units. Not maybe, we need to have them. Okay. And now as the input, we just encode this one character. No? Yeah, so let's, uh, let's, we have this character and then we have the past. So as an input, we encode this character. And as the output, we have the, the pronunciation for this character. And now what we do is, we use a feedback loop. We use 
so-called recurrent connections from the output neurons, from some of the output neurons, to some of the input neurons. So actually the, the encoding of our character happens here. And this is an input unit which is only used for these uh, recurrent connections. And now this leads to a memory. Such a network has a memory. Why? One step before, this was the, the input. And now, uh, this, the input from one step before led to the, uh, to the last output. And now this output, this output which we got from this, will be part of the new input. So we still have, due to this recurrent connection, we memorize the past. And maybe there is even a memory of the second last input character. Yeah? So the, the, the length of this memory depends on the learning process. Um, that's a very nice and interesting idea, but it, uh, I mean, it's hard to understand, for example, how much history of the past will be encoded in these recurrent weights. Of course, I, I mean, I could also do something like that. I could use a couple of recurrent connections. Um, it's, and it makes the dynamics of the networks much more complicated. We get again such problems that we had in the Hopfield type of networks because we do have cycles. But it's an interesting idea. Yeah. Okay, yeah, sequential learning. Um, and uh, of course, we didn't talk about um, unsupervised learning. Yeah? We just talked about supervised learning. So sorry for this. I mean, I, I really have to maybe during the Christmas holidays correct the translations. I mean, this, I would never translate this to learning without the teacher. In German, this is Lernen ohne Lehrer, yeah? because there is no, no, no translation of unsupervised to German. Yeah? In German, it's Lernen ohne Lehrer. But now my translator, he translated Lernen ohne Lehrer to learning without the teacher, which of course should be unsupervised learning. Um, okay, yeah, and there is a lot of literature on neural networks. Um, and also in, in our library, there is a large number of books on neural networks. Um, so at that time, uh, people ordered a lot of books. So just look into the library. Um, and maybe you should, you should be fast, because currently, since about half a year, they are just uh, removing books from the library. They throw them out, even good books. And the policy they have now, maybe I shouldn't say this for the video, <laughs> but why not? I mean, it's the truth. Uh, the policy is that they throw away all books that are older than 10 years. And I mean, there are quite, quite good books which are older than 10 years. And uh, especially among the neural network books, because they were popular in the, the 80s, 90s, and this is more than 10 years, so maybe they throw them out all. Okay, now let's get into the next chapter of reinforcement learning. Um, yes, and so we, we start with this example. I show you this little robot. Yeah, just come here to this uh, table. So this little robot does uh, reinforcement learning. Uh, when I switch it on, um, so we, we have these two joints, this one and this one. So it's a, the, the robot has two degrees of freedom and in the beginning when I switch it on, it just does random movements. Huh? It does random movements in both joints and then it will get feedback from this little encoder here which is like an, an automator in a bicycle. And this tells the robot whether it moves forward or backward 
and it also gives uh, the speed to the robot. And depending on the measured speed, the robot will improve his behavior. And the goal is, oh, I don't remember. It depends on these switches here. The goal is either to move forward or backward. We will see, hopefully. Oh, there is. So now it's still random movements. Okay, yeah, and now you see it already learned a policy uh, to move forward. It's still trying to improve the policy. Yeah, but that looks quite good. I mean, we could, for example, um, we could just uh, uh, modify the body of the robot and try uh, to let it walk uh, without this, these little legs. And you see, we have a policy again. It is, of course, different. Yeah. And also, the robot uh, will um, maybe learn a different policy when the underground changes. So let's, uh, let's put, uh, put it down on the floor. Can you see it here with the camera? No? So we're here, okay. Yeah. Let's put it like that. Yes. It takes much longer now. I mean, that happens from time to time that the robot explores very much uh, when the arm is in the air. And of course, now the robot uh, gets no feedback. And this makes uh, learning much harder. I mean, if there is no feedback, there will be no improvement. But I, it, 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 to me, it looks like a bug. Uh, that it's so long up in the air because uh, when it does random movements, it should get down again, too. But let's, let's just uh, reboot it. Yeah, we have the same problem again.
Okay, yeah, we, we get more or less the same policy. I just don't know why it takes so long now. But I mean, it's part of the reinforcement learning uh, algorithms surely this is not one of the best algorithms and we should we should actually work on improving the algorithm inside this robot I don't know what's going on here but let me show you try to show you something if I do it on the on the wet table here So uh, we we uh, we we made experiments, and it it turned out that it learns uh, quite a different policy on the wet table. the same okay uh, yeah, it, it was a slightly different mechanics of the robot that we used at that time but it looks like this robot prefers walking on the table and not on the floor <laughs> okay yeah so let's go back to the slides and uh, let's try to understand what's going on in here Yeah, I mean the task is to learn by trial and error which actions are good. Yeah? Um, I mean this is the way we humans uh, also learn many uh, behaviors like walking. Um, yeah. Yeah, and uh, I mean this reinforcement learning is interesting. Uh, of course also in robotics where we have to solve very complex tasks uh, which are either hard to program or maybe even impossible to program. Yeah? Uh, so everybody who has tried to program a robot to solve some uh, tasks in, a, in an unknown real world environment uh, starting with very complex object recognition then planning uh, action control this is a really very very hard uh, task to program and then if it's possible for the robot to learn uh, by itself that would be a great achievement yeah? and now um, I mean um, yeah I mean what, what you see here is negative reinforcement uh, when somebody tries to learn skiing um, and 
yeah, the thing you see here on this slide too is um, so before this person dropped down here, he did many actions. Yeah? It took maybe 10 seconds, maybe one minute, and in, uh, in one minute a person, I mean the cycle in our brain has something like 30 loops per second. So in, in 10 seconds uh, we do uh, around 300 elementary actions. And now the question, the problem in reinforcement learning is, is the so-called credit assignment problem. I mean, we get some negative credit here um, from falling down, and the question is, which ones of these 300 actions were the good ones and which ones were the bad ones? That's a problem. Let's look at this simple robot again. You, you have seen it whenever this arm is in the air. There is no, feed, no feedback at all. Huh? Feedback only comes in positions where these legs are uh, up and we do have such moves. Huh? I mean, we get positive reinforcement for this move and negative reinforcement for this move. Huh? And then, of course, the robot might learn this action is not good. Yeah? And this action is good. But that's the only thing the robot learns. Even, even this action, I mean, putting this, this joint up gives no reinforcement. We just take up the leg and now there is no reinforcement, so maybe the robot should learn this is not good. But that's, I mean, that's the problem. And then this move, there is no reinforcement, even though this move is very important, because then if I go down, it's very important that this leg is in front, and now we can get forward. The problem is that out of, most of our actions do not give a reinforcement signal, and now the question is, how can I assign this reinforcement to actions in the past? That's the problem we have in reinforcement learning. Okay, yeah. Um, so this is a simple model of this crawler. We have the two joints, which lead to two degrees of freedom. Um, and uh, in a very simplified view, this degree of freedom just makes an up and down movement of this end effector, of the tip here. Yeah? And this joint, uh, produces a horizontal movement of the tip, but this is only true for small angles. If the angles are bigger, then we get nonlinearities, but I don't uh, worry about this now. And now, I mean, an, one good policy is like that. Okay, yeah, let's go back. So we start here, the tip is up left, and then up right, down right, down left, up left. This is one cycle of a, a good policy. Okay, I mean we produced a different hardware which looked like that. My idea was, I mean here we are really in, in Euclidean space. Uh, this object can move up or down vertically and now this uh, blue bar can move to the right and to the left horizontally and now we are in Euclidean space and we don't have these angular, angular nonlinearities and this robot now moves like that. But it turned out, I mean we, we had the, the mechanical engineering department uh, construct such a robot and then we tried it and it didn't work. I thought this might be even uh, easier to understand and work better, but it didn't work. You know what's the reason why it didn't work? It was not due to a bad construction. I mean, and I am a physicist, so I should have known in advance. Huh? The problem is the, uh, the inertia of this central mass. I mean, the most weight of the robot is here in this central body. And now, um, 
if you do this move, these movements, you know what happens on the real robot and it's quite fast. What happens if I do this movement is I, was, I expected, okay, now the body moves to the right. No, what happens is the bar moves to the left due to the, uh, the inertia, the mass inertia. Huh? Um, we, we, didn't, we didn't think of that. So it turned out that this robot is much better. Huh? Because these, these two little arms, they are extremely lightweight. If they would be, if most of the mass would be here, then the same thing would happen. Huh? Um, and that's the reason why our arms and legs are pretty lightweight compared to the rest of the body. Huh? So, yeah. But we didn't, we didn't want to go into too many cycles of this development. Uh, it turned out this one works good and that's fine. Huh? Okay, now how, do, how uh, do we do the mathematical modeling of such a simple robot? I mean, the mathematics of this one and the other one are quite uh, similar. Um, in the easiest, simplest modeling, we have uh, four states, which means here the frame is to the left and down. Here it's the frame is to the left and up. Here it's to the right, up, right, down. Uh, and an optimal policy would be a cycle like that. Uh, but here in this, this is the state space, we have four states. And in each one of the states we have two actions, right, down, left, down, and so on. Um, and of course we can, we can use a finer discretization of the states so we can have a four, a four by four grid, and now in such a, a, a state like here, we have four possible actions. Here we have uh, three actions, two actions, two actions, and so on. And as you can already see here, um, many, there are many possible actions in each one of the states. What you see here in this uh, graph is a policy. What is a policy? A policy is one strategy for the robot. And this would be actually a, a, quite a good policy for our robot because suppose we start in this state. So the arm is on top left. And then we go down to this middle and then we would, we would end up in this cycle. And this is one such cycle. So the robot would start up here and then go down here. Uh, oh no, sorry. It would, it would start up here, would go down a little bit and then would move the arm forward, then go down, move it all the way backward and up again. And that's such a cycle. And from the starting states, we have to first come to the cycle and then uh, stay in the cycle. And this is one policy. And now the problem is so difficult because there are so many different policies. Let's look at, yeah, sorry. Um, where do we have this? Here, yeah. Let's, let's continue with this uh, slide. If we have a grid, a two by two grid, we have these four states. And now inside these nodes, the numbers, they give, uh, they are the number of possible actions. So here we have two actions in each one of the states. Huh? Um, so we have four states, but we have two to the power four policies. Why? Where does this come from? Yeah, we have two actions here. And for each one of the two actions I do here, I can make two actions here and two actions here. So I have to multiply the number of actions in all the states. So this gives us 2 to the power 4, which is 16. Now let's look at this bigger grid. We have four actions here, three here, two here, and so on. 
And now this gives us 2 to the power 4 times 3 power 4 times 4 power 1, which is 5184. And if we continue this and look at this grid with a, a 5 times 5 uh, state space, then we already have uh, 2 times 10 power 12 different policies. And this is actually, this little robot has a discretization of five states in each direction. So this is, this is the number of policies of this extremely simple little robot. Huh? So this little robot already has 10 power 12, what is that? 10, uh, so what is this in the English? It's million, billion, what is the next? After billion, trillion? Okay, so we have two trillion different policies and you have seen that within something like 30 seconds this robot learns an optimal policy out of this tremendously large number of policies. And now you can imagine what happens with more complex robots. If you have a robot with six or seven or maybe even 50 joints, no chance to combinatorially explore this uh, huge search space. So we really need to use intelligent techniques uh, that find maybe optimal or maybe close to optimal policies without exploring all of the search space. Okay, so yeah, let's uh, finish here. Thank you.